Welcome back to Tech Inspection, where we dive into a bunch of different topics all around drag racing, and we really want to focus on specific deep tech that you guys might not know about, you might be interested in, and every single week we're going to check out a different subject from around the world of drag racing, and this week we're checking out fuel injection, how far it's come in the last five to ten years, and we're also going to be talking to some guys over at Fuel Tech and talk about Fuel Tech specifically, the different offerings they have for tuning systems, as well as tuners that use them, and guys from Fuel Tech. And joining me again is Brian Wagner. Hey, man, what's going on? What's going on, Patty? Ready to talk some Fuel Tech? Oh, I am so ready because there are so many good tuning you know, software options out on the market for drag racing. And I've messed with Holly. I've messed with um, Fuel Tech. I've messed with, you know, a couple other ones. And Fuel Tech is definitely one of those ones you see a lot. It's a very good software. I want to talk to these guys and get the inside scoop on this because something I've been really interested in for a while. So I am very glad that we are talking about this. And also make sure viewers to stay tuned. We're going to do another one with uh, Holly. Uh, in a couple different episodes, you know, later down the road. But today we're focusing specifically on fuel tech. So um, I really want to get your feedback, Wagner, on you know the the kind of things that you want to address in this show. Uh, maybe give a little bit of a hint of what direction, what kind of questions we're going to ask our guests today, and maybe just talk really quickly through our guests. Yeah, I mean, the cool thing about this is we're going to be able to kind of look at the progression of fuel injection in the drag racing setting over so many years and kind of what fuel techs really exploded as part of that. And we're going to be able to look at, you know, how the self tuning side thing of works, you know, then incorporating the data logging, like they do the, the different levels of ECUs that they have for different levels of cars and just all these different things, you know, spark control ignition. It's, it's really going to be kind of wild to, to tie it all together and bring that to the fans. And then we've got the murderer's row of guests. We got Anderson Dick, the guy at Fuel Tech. We got Jamie Miller, the godfather of the Red Hot Mafia tuning. And then we got Mark Mickey, racer and tuner, Radio vs. the World Pro 275, been around a while. So we're going to get some really good perspectives from these guys about tuning and specifically what Fuel Tech brings to the table. Great. I am excited. <laughs> I'm ready to go. But now that we've given you guys a little bit of an intro to the show, talked about what we're going to, you know, specifically talk about and the guests we're going to have on. Let's just work it right into the fun segment of the week. So I was searching, you know, looking for some stuff. Last week we had an all billet twin turbo, 3000 horsepower C8 Corvette. That was hard to top. You, you know, Wagner, you had your Volkswagen with the Coyote, which was wild. And this week I found something from the guys over at MBE. I was just surfing through the web, you know, looking through the news feed and MBE actually came out with these killer all billet cylinder heads for small block Chevy and small block Ford. Now these things have been designed specifically for maximum flow, maximum efficiency, and just a ton of horsepower and strength. So to give you guys a couple little specs on these, we'll show some pictures and give you guys a, a little bit of a visual. But basically in the lowest flowing form, these heads flow 480 CFM on the intake and up to 500 CFM, depending on how the valves are cut and depending on how they do stuff. That's insane for a small block, any small block Ford, small block Chevy cylinder head. And the fact that they have a 2.29 inch diameter intake valve. That is bigger than a lot of big block Chevy intake valves. So, Wagner, talk to me, man. Small block. <laughs> That's the only way to look at it. You know, just the, the technology and the flow that these cylinder guy, the cylinder head guys, what they come up with is just off the charts. And it kind of makes me think of, uh, you know, in the no time world, they have that small block nitrous class. And, you know, how big is the small block and whatnot? And what can they cram into it? You know, with those kind of flow numbers, that's insane. I mean, that's just there's so much room for activities on what they're going to be able to do with those heads. It's going to be interesting how they use them. I mean, that's a pretty big blank canvas to play with. Oh, it, it's huge. And they also can, you know, change the chamber, change the way that they machine stuff um, what, and, and the porting design on all of them, depending on your application. So whether your nitrous are supercharged or turbocharged, what kind of power you're looking to make, like they can set up the heads for everything. And I think, I mean, once they go through testing, once they get on some cars and, you know, see how it all works out, they could be like a major staple in, 
heads up racing across the nation. So I just wanted to give them some screen time. I saw that it was really cool. Go onto their site, check them out. Really cool cylinder heads that look extremely nice. And uh, you know, if you're looking for max effort, small block Ford, small block Chevy, those are the ones to go with. Uh, Wagner, I don't know if you had anything or if that was just the fun segment for the week. Let's go with that for the week. Cause you know, I know you proposed it and I'm like, all right, that's fun because you know, it's not often we get to see something like that kind of broken out new and it, you know, it's, you know, if I won lottery money, what would I buy? You just buy those. Even if you're not going to put them on a car, you just put them in your man cave and be like, yeah, those are just some billet. You know, they just be right. Behind, they'd be right behind me right here. Just like a small block Ford single and a small block Chevy single cylinder head. <laughs> so, who, who needs a, who needs a tiger when you got gangster cylinder heads for some joy, right? <laughs> right. I, I totally agree, dude. That is 100%, you know, right on. So, all righty. Now that we've had our fun segment, I thought those cylinder heads were great. I'm looking forward to seeing them, testing them, and getting them out there. So now let's just dive right into the show. And it looks like we have Anderson Dick coming on next. Uh, Wagner, you want to give this guy a little bit of an introduction, a little bit of background on this guy? Anderson is the guy, the head of fuel tech. Very, very smart person. Very innovative with how he does things from Brazil. Fuel Tech's a Brazil based company. And he really has an interesting forward facing vision for the company. And I'm going to be running fuel tech on a soon to be announced drag zine project car. But just talking with him, you really get a feel on they're trying to put the racer first and get racer data on what they do. So they're a very they're a performance and racer driven company. So his idea is he's always thinking that they say that they're doing one thing, but they've already got four more steps planned behind it. So it's going to be interesting to get his feedback on some of these questions we have up and just, you know, learn more about what he thinks. So just a little bit is about fuel tech. If you don't know, if you've been living under a rock, possibly they are one of the main staples when it comes to all out performance, whether it's twin turbo, centrifugal, supercharger, big nights. I mean, it doesn't matter. It like, they're really big and sport compact. So like I have a couple import guy friends that the, you know, fuel tech FT 450, 550, even 600, they're running on these really, really fast imports. So they have a huge, a huge range of different cars they're going after. And they're, they're also, you know, planning to expand. So, you know, let's talk to let's talk to Adam. Adam. Dick. Hey, there he is. Perfect. I was right. running out of material. <laughs> <laughs> Anderson, what's going on, man? Good, good, man. Working from home and keeping keeping up with everyone. It's been it's a great pleasure to be here. And thank you guys for the invite. Hey, we we appreciate you coming on the show for sure. So, um, if you want. Let's talk about uh, fuel tech just a little bit. Your role there and how um, you've worked with the company, you know, over the last few years, and kind of what your guys' main goal is. Cool, cool. Yeah, so you can probably notice by my accent, I'm I'm Brazilian. So uh, I'm try I'm actually living in the US for almost four years now. Uh, I moved up here after being flying so frequently to US, and then our our main business is already US. So we, I, I actually founded a company uh, 18 years ago in Brazil. Uh, it seems like yesterday, but you know, uh, we just get old and, and been learning every day and uh, doing what we love. So it's it's a very nice challenge. Uh, so I, been, I mean, I, my position pretty much is like I'm I'm the CEO, but mainly I'm the head of uh, the development and R and D. Uh, as well the strategies uh, so I'm, I'm grateful to have a great team uh, a big a lot of people that are really passionate about what we do so that's I think that's one of the biggest reasons why we were we're growing and strongly succeeding lately and you know kind of going off of that Anderson seeing kind of how you guys have grown and whatnot let's talk about what fuel tech brings to the drag racing ec world because you guys got everything from like mild to hot and spicy with your ecus you know what what have you guys put into the development to make these work so well for drag racing i think first i consider i consider fuel tech probably one of the few or maybe the only drag racing uh, focus at ecus in the market so I think we we really uh, were were born on a drag racing environment, and we really really deepest deepest invested on, on on this market. And obviously, because first it starts with a passion. I mean, we're truly uh, passionate about drag racing, and 
honestly, it may not be the the smartest decision a few years ago because not all the other ECU manufacturers were focusing on other markets that may be even bigger. But I think we 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 did a, some good choices and and some uh, intelligent uh, decisions about how folk how well we could focus on drag racing and develop specific features on our ECUs and always keeping the ECUs like with uh, no custom firmware, so open software, so everybody can have access which for every feature. So I think this kind of strategy been very successful because uh, we were trying a little different from other ECU on a way of actually, if we if one of our uh, friends or tuners or, or clients have uh, help us designing a new feature, uh, we first design it for free, so we don't charge for custom firmers. And second, we share to every client, so it becomes a public uh, free update for everyone. So this is how we've been growing a lot, because every new update, uh, I could I could name a bunch of very important people that really help it to test and, and develop and come up with those features. But that, that benefits like thousands of people when it comes online. So I think the the, uh, the the timing or the times of the cars have been dropping a lot in the last few years uh, and part of that is definitely because the technology is becoming more available and widely available for every racer i definitely think that's one thing that's coming through is just the advancements in general and how much how many different racers are just expanding and making things faster and faster and finding new ways to do stuff. And I think that fuel tech, you guys have been doing a great job with that for sure. Um, on kind of along that same subject, uh, let's talk about FT spark and also FT coils and how that's something that's, it, I believe it's somewhat new and you might have to school me a little bit on it, but talk to me about how that has changed and, and what you guys use that for and how it's a big advantage. Yeah, that, that's actually, for sure, one of the biggest advances advance in the last few years. Um, drag racing market been using magnetos for so many de decades, uh, and they been they done a great job uh, increasing the level of power, especially in, on methanol uh, feed cars and turbo cars, and, and especially blown uh, cars. So we figured that. Nobody was really investing on extreme high power uh, ignition system for individual coils because uh, even the mag having like a very powerful output, it still depends on the self-generated and the, the distributor. Uh, so it was really demanding to have a newer technology on that part. So what we we actually thought was, man, let's do just the strongest, is I mean, ignition even possible nowadays because I can say like 10 years ago or maybe even less like 80 or 7 years ago there was not even the technology available to do this kind of uh, CDIs we're doing now uh, and honestly being a small company and like almost like a family business uh, I'm so proud to see that the market is approving and following us because now we see more products like having that kind of technology and we had some already before but it wasn't really popular on the really high level tra drag racing so now now it's almost like a new tech a new tra i mean a, a mandatory product to run a really high horsepower engine uh, I, I can also tell like uh, we designed it the, the best we could but we're not even sure if that will be really uh, helpful as we expect it to be the good news is actually even using our hub dyno, which has been very busy for the last years, um, we had so many situations where we were able to prove back and back uh, we, uh, that a stronger ignition system is so helpful and can pull and can bring more more performance, even on some cases that you're not expecting to see that. So even like a nitrous car, I mean, pro nitros really being gas gasoline everyone always thought that no no ignition power is really not mandatory for nitrous you, you just run an air fuel that is not that rich so it's okay but we actually proved the opposite we proved that 
you can run richer if you have strong ignition because you don't you won't you won't reach misfire which is not a good news for a nitrous engine uh, then if you don't if you can run richer you actually can just you, okay you're losing horsepower because you're richer but then you just add more nitrous i mean it's it's just like a turbo car i mean why would you run let's say 30 pounds lean if, if you can run 90 pounds rich and, and and survive the engine the nitrous is just the same deal you, you just run a lot of nitrous and, and strong ignition you, you're safer and making way more horsepower so th this is a small example Sp speaking of horsepower you know, something you guys have kind of baked into your product. I mean, there's so many advanced features <laughs> that's in a fuel tech, you know, playing around with the software. I'm like, man, I don't even know what this does, but it's going to look pretty cool if I can figure it out. You know, one of the things you guys have in there is, you know, your own kind of brand of traction management. You know, what have you guys put into that to make that work so well? For definitely it's track time and definitely listen to the tuners. And I, I can list like... 100 tuners that interact with us very often uh, and uh, one good example is like Jamie Miller, Steve Patty, uh, those guys, they they eventually, they, they're not like engineers, they're not like high tech guys, but they know what they want, you know what I mean? So our job is actually translate their desire into electronics. So. A perfect example, the last update, the 430 update we just released a few a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we did a change on the track control and the time-based uh, rev limiters, uh, which Steve Petty was trying to explain us what he didn't like, especially on the Pro Charger cars, which were so dependent on the on the RPM because the boost pretty much is proportional to the RPM, engine RPM. So he wanted to RPM to be more, I mean, smoother. And we actually talking on the racetrack, on the on the pits, like, and then he gave up an idea about smoothing the the RPM channel to actually use that as a reference to the to the traction control. And that, and they say, man, let's try, Let, let's try, and we try that, and it worked flawless, and it was like amazing. And then th that's a small example of how we actually work closely to the teams. Uh, and the, how that benefits everyone, because now that's like public available is not only for him, let's say this way. So one other thing that we wanted to touch on is basically you, you talked about it a little bit, but I wanted to get a little more inside scoop on the way that you guys kind of approach tuning a turbo car versus a supercharged car versus a nitrous car. You talked about nitrous quite a bit. Let's talk more on the force induction side. Like you said, you're, you've been super busy on your uh, hub dyno, lots of really big numbers, lots of tuning data. Uh, talk about your um, tuning on the force induction side and then also maybe help viewers understand the difference between tuning on the dyno and tuning on the track because from what you've said here and then from what I've seen you guys talk about in other places, like the track is where the majority of the stuff gets done, but where does the hub dyno come in when, it, when it's, okay. you know, pertaining to force induction tuning? Yeah, definitely the hub dyno is a it's a new level on rep, uh, representing better the track conditions because we for the first time on a hub dyno we can actually dyno a car above 2000 horsepower uh, second we can we can we can uh, recreate let's say the the, the time based or the drive shaft curve or or i mean really do a let's say a 6 second pass quarter mile pass shift all the gears leave on the trans brake so it is so now closer to the actual track tuning that this is probably what advanced more lately on the dyno tuning uh, because it, it was almost impossible. I mean, it was I I never seen a car over 2,000 horsepower in a roller dyno. Uh, it may be eventually possible, but it, then you can't really shift the car. You can only pick one gear, and and then then your tune up is just not really right. So the hub dyno helped on that aspect, uh, and also to dial numbers uh, to startup. And talking about turbo cars and, and blower, I mean any kind of force inductions, we've been learning so much how much fuel so fuel amount or fuel supply is a very accurate um, pr procedure of startup tuning. So right now it's. Um, if you know, if you have a precise injector, a, a 
a correct fuel pressure <coughs> sorry uh, you you can clearly uh, estimate a fuel map based on your expectations of the engine so I'll, I'll give a small example if you have a, a thousand horsepower naturally aspirated v8 okay uh, that's like a good hemi uh, any kind of those so naturally aspirated so that that actually means that you you need probably fuel, you need fuel at zero psi of boost for a thousand horsepower, uh, and there is a rule like 0. 0.6, which means like if you divide by 0. 0.6, you can actually have uh, exactly what you need in fuel supply. So it'll be like 1600, pretty much uh, 1666 pounds per hour of fuel. So if you want to start of that, you're very likely to be very close on that tune-up. Then let's say you, you say, okay, I, I'm going to run 30 pounds. I mean, uh, let's say 30 pounds of boost on this engine. Every 15 pounds, you double the power mainly if you, if you keep uh, all, everything in, in the efficiency, uh, like the turbos and everything else. So at 15 pounds, you need double of this fuel. At 30 pounds, you need to triple this fuel. And 60 pounds, you just need five times this fuel. So. If you actually start a base map on that, and the way the fuel tech maps are, like you could pretty much type the pounds per hour uh, on the fuel map, you're very likely to do the first run and have the spark, the plugs kind of start getting some heat already, or or even closer. Then you definitely tune by the the, the plugs because the plugs can, I mean, probably everyone who is listening to us is most of the guys tune learn how to tune by the plugs so many years ago and that's still up to date so then you actually can trim and go your engine back, uh, properly and once you're in the ballpark uh, you know already the horsepower so and then you need to square the engine and doing that part so that's it and and don't and people a lot of what we're seeing is like you don't have to go to the limit to the tuning limit unless you're like nhra uh, pro mod <laughs> But everyone else can really run on a safer side uh, and just run more boost. So uh, it's it's that's been what we've been seeing on the dyno and the track and and everyone. And so a little bit more on that. Basically, when you're talking about building that base map and you have a general idea of how much power it's going to make and how much fuel that's going to consume, I'm guessing you're talking about like brake specific fuel consumption and kind of building from there. Is the, am I right to yes, assume absolutely. that? Yes, absolutely. And this number, like 0.6 as a factor, it, it, that takes in consideration a lot all of that and also kind of experience with different cars. But definitely for a turbo alcohol car, that's, that's a typical number ends up. I mean, I think that, you know, sums it up right there. I learned a lot that 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 example you gave right there, Anderson, was perfect. And I think that'll explain a lot to our to our viewers so they can get a, an understanding of what goes into this. I mean, I, you know, I, I learned a lot there, Petty. What about you? Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it was really cool. And I, and I loved how you talked about the um, the hub dyno versus the track, because like you said, in the past, in the past, that's something that is not always you know been like ah oh, yeah you can tune on the chassis dyno but let, like let, let's just get to the track and start there but you you know didn't bust a myth but definitely bridge the gap over what's happened in the last few years of like hey you know the hub dyno is actually a really good start to like what we're doing it's not so far off and so i really like that you brought that up so thank yeah. you so much for that and uh wagner did you have any other questions i i'm really actually good. one good stuff. just one consideration the hub dyno also been very helpful for the first shakedown of a new car or after because man i can tell you we probably saved 15 race cars uh to be trashed at least in the last year uh, with, with what i mean is like if what happened on the hub dyno and was perfectly controlled happened on the track that would be an accident for sure so i mean fuel lines problem or engine problem or oil down or even like blowing up or whatever happened but it's a uh, it's so much safer to shake down the car on the dyno so even if you have let's say a proline racing engine uh which is the tuner the proline tuners they have their engine really well tuned they really don't need to start tuning from scratch on the hub dyno but they do for every single car because they really 
want to make sure the car is working perfect. So you make sure the transmission is fine. The drive shaft is bolted, you know what I mean? And it's, it's even stupid stuff like that. You can even see the suspension uh, extending on the dyno. Uh, that, that kind of stuff, if you really can see on the dyno, uh, it can save you a lot of track time and not only money, but saving the car itself. Oh, that, that makes a lot of sense to me for sure. And, and it's interesting you talk about like, you know, watching the suspension separate, you know, like on radio cars where it's just, you know, really using that four link and the suspension. Uh, Anderson, thank you so much for being on here. Wagner, uh, I'm good. Did you have anything else for him? No, I mean, I, I suggest people do like what I do and check out Fuel Tech's website and their uh, social media to learn more and check out some of those hub dyno videos. So uh, thanks thank for coming you guys on, Anderson. And appreciate and keep up with the good good work there. We need everyone to 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 go through this crisis and, and make sure we run we keep racing by the end of the year everyone is crazy to come back for the to the track absolutely thank you so much for bringing that up and thank you for being on the show so everyone that was anderson dick from fuel tech what a what a great guest really lucky to have him on and his insights and obviously like i learned a lot wagner i know that you talked about learning quite a bit so uh, let's just, uh, I guess, keep moving on. So now that we've had a, uh, you know, somebody from Fuel Tech, now we can move into uh, a tuner and, you know, and talk about how they use Fuel Tech and, and what their personal experiences are. And I think our next one is Jamie Miller. Jamie Miller, you know, the Red Hat Mafia, you know, he's one of the, the godfathers of it, like I said earlier. And you'll see him as one of the gentlemen at the track, always really tuning and he looks he tunes every aspect of the car but definitely you know he's always on the keyboard making adjustments and whatnot very very smart person that races and tunes on stuff that you know just not radio tire cars you know michael bealey's nhra pro mod a lot of different vehicles so he has quite a bit of experience as well so uh looks like jamie's joined us so let's uh yep. absolutely this interview. Hey. Uh, perfect segue hey jamie thank you so much for being on the show we really appreciate it uh, just want to start off, uh, to talk about your experience, uh, you know, racing a little bit and, uh, and talk about your experience with fuel tech and, you know, what, what you've seen over maybe the last few years. Okay. So, um, basically, you know, I've run classes from NHRA pro mod to RVW to X 275, um, run some pro mod classes in, uh, NMCK as well. Um, you know, my go-to ECU platform is fuel tech. Um, I've, I've had some experience with other, uh, systems out there, but, uh, obviously I choose to, you know, use fuel tech pretty much exclusively. Um, you know, the, uh, the power management, things like that, um, that we've worked with Anderson and, and you know, I, I definitely want to say that those guys are, um, a great group of guys to work with and, and the development that they make happen and in the time frame they make it happen. Um, is is really impressive when you've dealt with other manufacturers and know what typical timeframes are to you know to get new features added and things that myself, Petty, all the guys from Proline look to you know we we might be out there and find something. Hey, you know, it would really be nice if the system could do this. And and Anderson and his, and his team are on that. You know, and and it's 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 very impressive how quickly they get stuff to come uh, you know to light for us and and with updates and things like that. To, to kind of dig into something that you you said there, power management, and that's something I want to talk about with you know just jack you know drag racing ECUs in general, but with power management with fuel tech, kind of give our viewers an idea of what goes into maximizing you know making that work properly with a fuel tech system. So basically, what we we utilize now um, drive shaft sensor. Um, we also work with engine plots where you're basically controlling the rate of acceleration on the engine, um, which can be done with uh, rev limiters. It can be done with just pure timing. Um, so on a, let's talk for, for a minute on like radial application. Um, I'll use drive shafts to control wheel speed, but I'll also use engine um, engine curves. So you're, you're combining both of those features and, and working them together, which I haven't seen systems work uh, as well, utilizing both those features at the same time. So, you know, you'll on a radio car, for instance, like uh, Dwayne Mills, Ken Cartuccio's car, where it'll run a drive shaft plot. But then for some reason, if the air changes and the motor's really trying to accelerate much quicker, 
I've got an engine platform or a you know plot over the top of it that will control that as well. And it, it just it also allows us to be able to uh, guys will ask me all the time, hey, how do you know what the car is going to run? Because I you know that's kind of a little thing that I do. I try to name tune-ups. We say, okay, I'm pretty certain that the car, all things being here, track conditions say the same. I think we can run X, and and the car usually runs within a number or two of that. And so that's nice to be able to predict what the what it is, you know, what it's going to run and how it's going to go down the racetrack. If you could name three things, um, the, the kind of in the arena that you just talked about, because you, you you yourself talked about it, like hey, like I could probably name off within two or three numbers what the car is going to run, and then it'll run it. Other tuners out there do the same thing. What would be the main? three factors, five factors that go into being able to dial in a car like that, because we're talking about cars that are on the ragged edge. They're breaking records all the time. They're on drag radial tires. They have weights. They have turbo limitations, supercharged limitation, limitations, cubic inches. Talk to me about how <laughs> those are wild animals with power adders. Right. Um, exactly. You know, here's, here's what it comes down to. You certainly have to build a database, right? know um what the uh the, the converter is going to act like what your engine plot's going to to run like so some of the things that i'll do uh, and myself petty a lot of us do the same thing if, if you're going to go out for instance let's talk about like uh trying different converters if you have the same rear gear in okay you know that the drive shaft is going to be x to run let's just call a three let's let's just say 365 okay on a 350 radial with a, a 389 gear. We know basically the drive shaft speeds that it's going to run, okay? So that being said, if we wanna try a different converter, we have that drive shaft plot now. So then we can kind of move our engine plots out and figure out, okay, now this is the trend of this new converter. This is the RPM range that the engine's running in to achieve that same ET, okay? So it gives us a huge, um, we can we can make these changes much quicker having all this data, right? And so I would say my my key factors are what I look for is in any system, and, and this is why I go back to the fuel tech. An engine plot is crucial for me, a drive shaft plot, and then obviously most systems have a, a, a basic, let's call it a launch retard curve, where you can put a defined timing curve in it um, off the release of the trans brake or a clutch switch, and and it runs a you know a generic timing um, retard that you've implemented into it, okay? But then these system goes beyond that, and it also does it intuitively as far as if the, if the, if the engine starts to out-accelerate it, we have a window that we allow it to pull X amount of timing, okay? So that, that's really what makes it – so if you're at, for example, we'll, we'll say like Donald's races on radials where you can start during the day and the DA could be, let's just call it 2,000 feet above – and then you'll get to nighttime, you're sitting there, it's one o'clock in the morning, and the DA has just dropped down to negative 400 feet, right? So there is a huge difference in power that the, that the engine is seeing. So if you don't have those curves to keep it in check, you can really get yourself into trouble. Now, sometimes it works out, right? Track conditions are phenomenal. It makes it, you go out and you run your fastest passes you've ever made. Okay, that's great. The other side of that is it's got so much power off the button that it rips the tire off and you have no control over it. So that's why I myself I try to utilize all those features in the system to control it, and that's why I'm I'm controlling the rate of acceleration and why I'm able to predict ET numbers. Right on. You know, the, the, kind of interesting how you put all that out there. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. You know, you, you've tuned nitrous blower cars and turbo cars, right? right? Out of all of those you know, power adders across the board, all the ins horsepower insanity that you've got to touch, which is your favorite one? Without a, without a question, turbo stuff is my favorite. Um, I'm just a diehard turbo lover. You know what I mean? Um, I know guys are against a lot, you know, you get a lot of hate from people on it, but uh, I, I do. I really like the turbo cars. You know, my experience with nitrous um, is kind of lower level as far as um, I do quite a bit of 632, Outlaw 632 racing, which I've done with Ken Cartuccio, uh, Mike Comet. And, you know, we, I've, I've myself have learned a bunch um, just power management wise with the, with the, uh, the nitrous combinations. And again, it's, it's funny because I started off, you know, really just focusing on the turbo stuff and with fuel tech and then transitioned into running progressive nitrous controllers through fuel tech. Um, and, and the system just, uh, it works in for so many different applications. 
it's 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 really impressive how how you can get it to work and and you know it's funny like when I first started doing that stuff I'm like okay all right progressive controller to me that's nothing but a boost controller right we're just gonna ramp that in like I would ramp my boost in with with control <laughs> and it actually worked out pretty pretty slick and that that's interesting because all the different power adders have their own kind of characteristics and how they operate so it is that something that also kind of with the fuel tech and how you tune do you 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 lose use and learn from each one oh right? absolutely no question um you know going back to it like the nitrous stuff like i said you know um knowing that how we run uh let's just call a boost ramp i've really looked at saying okay well why can't i apply power the same way you know on a nitrous car obviously you know a nitrous car basically the power is let's add on an outlaw 632 uh one second 1.2 but that same approach and how you're applying power and using again going back to those engine curves and drive shaft plots and things like that utilizing those same systems that i do on a on a, on a turbo car but you just don't need uh let's say the authority on an engine plot or authority on the on the on the drive shaft plot because the nitrous will uh, a nitrous car especially 632 will respond to much less timing than let's say a twin turbo deal that's making over 4,000 horsepower awesome man well appreciate your time for sure you know we've learned a lot here and i think that there you you've you've opened up a lot of different cans of worms that we can bring you back on for sure on a lot of different stuff but uh appreciate your time and uh look forward to seeing once we get back out the racing this year and i will pick your brain some more at some point right? sounds great that man is so well spoken and so and you know just puts a lot out there with what he has to offer i mean i i learned a lot there for sure and that's uh that's that's a gold mine of information for our viewers as well but uh the next gentleman that we have on um he, he's got a little bit of a reputation and some some credentials too right petty oh absolutely i mean what i know him best for is the fact that i believe he still has the mile per hour record for radio versus the world. Everybody uh, put your hands together while you're watching this. I don't know why you do that, but just do it anyway. <laughs> Mark, Mickey, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show, man. We really appreciate it. Oh, hey, thanks for having me, man. So, so if you just want to talk a little bit about um, maybe your car and your experience with fuel tech and kind of the different options and the different things that you guys use fuel tech for in your car to make record setting passes and be as competitive as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fuel tech has been really good to us. Um, you know, I'm trying to think it's probably been four or five years ago. We had a different EFI on the car and we're struggling. Um, and we just were at our wits end. So, you know, we got with Eric Dillard at ProLine. Eric's like, look, we need to put fuel tech on here. Let's get this thing going. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We actually put the Eric LaFerry, a friend of ours, we flew him in to, I think it was lights out and basically had no EFI on the car. Eric wired the car, did it all, you know, got it ready, got it hooked up. Um, Anderson from fuel tech came over. I'd never met the man, you know, just walked up and said, Hey, here's a tune up, put it in the car. This will work. We put it in the, you know, put it all in there. I mean, the thing started instantly worked flawless. Um, that weekend we set our best, you know, uh, you know, we went first time in the threes, first time over 200 and, you know, just, it, it opened my eyes to how good a product they have and the support. And, um, so yeah, they've, they've been nothing but an asset for us. Um, uh, they're a huge, you know, they're the huge part of the whole program we have and, you know, why we were able to, you know, set the record back when we did 362 and why we still hold the speed, you know, 221. That's just a testament to the horsepower that the motors make and what the fuel tech does for us. So Absolutely. And I, I think I, I want to go back on something you said earlier about basically when you first met Anderson. You're just, you're just like, hey, like, here's your ECU. Just, just put it in and you're good to go. And then it's like, oh, bam, there's threes. <laughs> Like that is, yeah. that's completely bananas because I don't know of anybody else that could actually, oh yeah, like a tuner that comes up, hey, here's your ECU, just go run. It, it's going to haul, it's going to haul ass. And it's like, oh, and you did it and and you're here and you're talking about it. And, you know, you also still have the mile per hour record. I can't emphasize that enough to anybody because if anybody knows 221 in, in mile per hour in the eighth is insanely impressive still the record after quite some time and like i said really glad to have you on the show glad you had that little bit of a you know introduction so uh talk to us about the options that you guys use 
most in fuel tech and also what has provided you the most insight and the basically getting over the learning curve of starting with an entirely new fuel injection system? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. when we first started with it, I was shocked. It's, it's a really easy, simple system. I mean, when you really break it down, uh, the way they have the software, you know, I'm not a tuner by any means, um, but I can kind of fumble my way through stuff. And it's, they just do an outstanding job. It makes sense when you click on something and, you know, how they've got it laid out. It makes sense. Um, our stuff, I run our car pretty simple. Um, I don't really use a lot of the traction control or drive shaft curves. Um, the main reason is I just don't have time to sit there and peck on the computer because, you know, it's just me and Jason. So I'm having to maintenance the motor, maintenance the car between rounds and don't have time to do it. Um, you know, you take Jamie Miller, he's the master at that. I mean, that guy can sit there and poke and, and move a dot here or there and gain just numbers all over. Um, and that's the beauty that fuel tech will let you do that. Um, me personally, I'm a little old school. So I turn, I just, I basically tune my stuff by, you know, timing, you know, time-based timing curves, uh, fuel. And I used to utilize our, um, our converter dumps quite a bit, which the fuel tech really gives me that option. Um, I think in there we use, I use a lot of my dumps on, um, their mechanical fuel timers, which is a really good good setup because you can turn them on and off multiple times during the run it's all time based and um, so that's probably you know the majority of my stuff when i roll up there we leave the boost curve normally my boost curve's pretty pretty i guess consistent i don't play with the boost curve a lot i just manipulate timing and the dumps more than anything to do my power management to the racetrack so kind of going off of that again you know it, it's interesting that you're one of the one of the few really high level racers that will still, you know, bang on the keyboard or on your own stuff quite a bit. And one of those important parts is, you know, data, data, data makes everything go, you know, what do you, you know, what kind of stuff do you look at data logging wise, you know, what, what's in your, you know, when you pop open that screen and it looks like all the crazy graphs are going everywhere, you know, <laughs> yeah. what are you guys looking at? Um, You know, like my number one thing I'm going to pull up is I look at uh, engine RPM, drive shaft rpm and g meter that's probably my two number one things um and then i'll i guess you know i'll also once i kind of look at that that can tell me the run you know if it goes out and smokes the tires or what have you i can um can kind of go back and i can look at you know the g meter hey hey the g meter started falling off here or this you know this is where my drive shaft was my numbers you know was i just too hot before i got to that part of the track was um, G meter too high. You know, I use that a lot. I, I tune our stuff off of my initial G meter reading where it rolls the G meter. Um, you know, and that, you know, depending on the run that I have in it, you know, I'll look at that kind of tells me how, you know, how hot the car was, you know, if it made it went out and made a good run, you know, I kind of, kind of save that in the back of my mind, but if it went out and smoked the tires. I'll kind of look at the G meter before it smoked the tires. And I can say, well, I probably was trying to go too fast right there. Um, and then just the basics, I, you know, I always pull up O2 just to look at the O2s. Um, I tune all my stuff pretty much off of um, EGTs and plugs. That's how I kind of go off of my stuff. Um, as far as the engine, to make sure the engine's happy, you know, look at the plugs, EGTs, and, and um, that kind of tells me where I'm at on it. Um, so, yeah, mine's, mine's pretty basic, you know, just initial when I first pull it up, so. And so um, one last question that I have for you, Mark, is basically yeah. obviously your, your car and your team and, and how you race are very top tier, right? I mean, Radio vs. The World, as most people, if not everybody knows, is insanely competitive and you've done very well at it for you know quite some time. If there was something that you could kind of give to other racers that might not be to that level, maybe they're a 235 car, maybe they're a 650 index bracket car that's running fuel tech, maybe they're a no time car. What are there two or three or four things that you could say, you know, from your experience that you would like suggest them doing if they, you know, don't already do it basically to kind of trickle down and be like, Hey, you know, we're up here, but a lot of stuff we do up here can translate to what, you know, street guys or no time guys or no prep yeah. guys are doing. Right. Um, I mean, the number one thing, what I see, and you know, I work in the industry every day is our main focus when we go to the racetrack, 
my race car is ready to race. Like we don't, it's a bad day if you got to work on the race car at the racetrack. I mean, that's our goal. We don't want to work on the race car very much at the track. So we really focus on making sure you're prepared. Make sure when, you know, when I unload my car, I already have a tune up. I kind of know I'm going to run the car. The car's a hundred percent. All we got to do is put on projects, warm it up, gas it up. So preparation is what I see. Most guys, they'll show up unprepared to the track and just not ready. And they're working on the car and this and that before they make a run. Um, that's probably the number one. Uh, number two is just maintenance. Keep your stuff in top condition. Maintenance the hell out of it. You don't have to have the best parts or the, the most expensive pieces on your car. But if everything's in great shape and it's working and functioning, you know, that's that's a big deal. Um, I look at a lot of data for guys all the time and I'll see they don't, you know, they may just not, oh, we don't have the, you know, I'll say, well, what what's your trans pressure? It's not working. Well, that sensor's not working. You know, well, you, you know, this sensor's not working. This part of the car, we, we just haven't fixed that yet. That's the thing, you know, it's all the little details, you know, get your stuff 100%. When you show up, make sure everything on that race car is 100% then you're setting yourself up for success. So in my opinion, kind of dovetailing off of that, that's interesting. You say about being prepared because when we had Anderson on one of the points he made with, you know, what they do at fuel tech and how they kind of, what they do is they, they bring people run on that hub dyno, you know, is that a way that you can shake stuff down? And then, you know, is there what you, is there things that you've been able to learn with the fuel tech on that? You know, once you're shaking things down to make, be prepared. Yeah, I mean that hub dyno is worth every every you know penny it costs to run it every hour you have to put into putting it on there. It's worth it. Um, you know our own experience. You know we we put the new FT six hundred on last year and the coil and plug and we took it down there. Um, Michael Button wired the whole car for us on and on. Uh, we put it on and we just beat the hell out of it on their dyno and we ran it, we ran it, we ran it, and we weren't worried early. We weren't worried about the big numbers. Um, we got caught up in that later and tried to you know. Rope just bend the needle as far as we could. And, um, but yeah, what I could tell you coming off that hub dyno, it showed me a lot of small details, like in the tune up, you know, I could make a one or 2% change. It would show up on the dyno, you know, stuff you don't see on the racetrack. Um, learned a lot there. The biggest success on that is we came off that hub dyno, went straight to a racetrack and put a tune up in the car off the dyno that we thought should run them, you know, 375 to 377. The car went out, went 377 instantly off the dyno. Um, everything was 100%, and we just kept pecking at it, pecking at it. Yeah, I mean, that dyno saved me a week at the racetrack. So, Well, Mark, I, I hate to cut you short, but we are out of time. I uh, just want to, you know, thank you again so much for being on the show, giving us your insight, yep. you know, and, and everything that happens with your crew and also that trickle down to maybe possibly other racers. So thank you so much for being on. And uh, we look forward to, you know, talking to you possibly in future episodes. So again, thank you. Yeah. Thanks guys. All right. All right. See you. Thanks Mark. Bye. Really lucky to have Mark Mickey come onto the show and give his insight as a driver slash, you know, basically, crew manager of his whole race team very competitive team very good driver he knows what he's talking about and along with our you know other guests jamie miller and anderson dick what a great episode a lot of big brains really uh, happy to have them on uh wagner any final thoughts on everything today i learned that mark mickey's big tip is make sure all your sensors work before you ask for help number one tip but no i mean you know outside of that you know it People may think that this was a, you know, a fuel tech commercial. It wasn't. This was about learning about what this system offers and kind of what it's all about because of how robust and what it does. And to me, there there was a lot of really good information put out there about these tuners, especially in the segment what Jamie put out there. And then additionally, what Anderson put out there with what the company does. And then you tie it up with Mark and, you know, what you learn from a racer, you know, it's... A lot of good information here. And again, it's one of those deals where we could talk for hours with these guys and we just we just got to try to boil it down the best we can. Absolutely. I love the like the the translation between chassis dyno or like the hub dyno and the track. And basically, there's a lot of other things. While we were talking about fuel tech, there were a lot of other subjects that bleed into a bunch of different areas. So that was really awesome to see. And make sure to stay tuned. We're going to be coming out with a new episode next week. We're not going to give you all the details on it, but you're not going to want to miss the next episode of Tech Inspection.